The San Ysidro Port of Entry is home to the busiest border crossing in the world. Millions of people travel between Mexico and the United States every year by foot or by car. But some Californians are crossing the border for a special reason. They're moving to Tijuana to escape the housing crisis in San Diego County. Our lease was up in San Diego. They raised our rent to almost to 15. It was going to be 16 if we went month to month. And we left it down here, so we just decided to make the move. Joseph Davis and his girlfriend Ileana Hoyos traded in their hipster apartment in North Park for the sound of waves and beach sunsets in Playas de Tijuana. To put this size space across the street from the beach anywhere in San Diego or in California period would be three times what we're paying here. The medium home value in San Diego is 632000 a 2.3% increase over the past year. But this couple found a two-bedroom apartment for just $800. The lack of affordable housing forced the couple across the border to Tijuana, where they were able to keep their bartending jobs. I call an Uber every day to the border, which is anywhere from 5 to $7. In just an 8-mile and 20-minute drive, Davis reaches U.S. Custom and Border Patrol at the San Ysidro Port of Entry. As soon as I get across, I just hop on the trolley, which is $2.50. The trolley is about a 35-minute ride just 13 station stops to get to downtown San Diego. Then Davis walks six blocks to get to work, but often has enough time to run errands on his way. Dang, those are the only two? I should have one that's just in a small bag, like, like that one right there or something. It's just a beanie. Today, Davis ran into a co-worker who he previously tried to convince to move to Tijuana. If you're gonna end up moving in Mexico, you just you shoot no, me a text. definitely, yeah. Yeah, you know, that was my, I, was, I started reconsidering everything when you told me what you paid down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so yeah, that's, that's an option. I'll give you a call. All right. Yeah. Hi, right, brother. All right, Take dude. care, man. Davis's 23-mile commute using public transportation totals just an hour and 15 minutes. However, Hoyos can take anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours waiting just to cross the border. She crosses the international border by car due to late night shifts when the trolley does not operate. Before heading to work, Hoyos checks the borderline wait times. It just depends on what lane you're in, how fast it's moving. The far right lane usually moves the fastest because it splits into two or three lanes at the end. Hoyo scrolls on her phone and buys food from vendors until it's her time to cross. They'll just randomly go up to cars and ask you to pop the trunk open. They'll open your doors, tap the doors, see if there's stuff in them. She usually stops at downtown San Diego to check her P.O. box and buy food for her dog when she has time to spare. And the so chickens of warm meat? Yes. Okay. It's still another nine miles until Hoyos reaches the patio on Lamont in Pacific Beach, a commute that totals an hour and 45 minutes. Despite the commute and the record-breaking number of homicides in Tijuana in 2018, Americans are still moving to the city by the sea. TJ isn't what they make it out to be in the movies or on TV. It's a great place with great people, great food, and you can have a lot of fun and not have to partake in any of the crazy stuff that you hear about. The couple collectively saves at least $1,000 a month and say they plan to remain Tijuana for the near future. For Annenberg Media, I am Marcela Valdivia. Now to talk more about a balanced lifestyle, we have one of LA Certified Life Coaches. Please welcome Nicole Hanasov. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Okay, so to start off, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of self-care? Yes, this is one of my favorite topics. Self-care is so important to be able to accomplish anything. And we live in a time where people are doing and doing and they're accomplishing and they, you know, they're on the go all the time, which is great. But usually what happens, the first thing out the window on the back burner is yourself. People forget to eat. They stop exercising because they're so busy or whatever that is important to them, they put it to the side because they're busy. It's right? always that work home routine or work school routine. Right? Exactly. Constantly. Exactly. But people don't recognize, realize that in order to be able to do and to be able to have the energy to accomplish anything, you need to have energy inside of you, right? So we, people are like cups and we have water and inside of our cup and what we do is we want to pour water in everyone's cup. We're helping this person, we're doing that, we're doing that and what happens, you get to a point of exhaustion because there's no more water in your cup and you get frustrated and you get angry and you become kind of just in a bad mood, you yeah. know, oh, and yeah. you get to that oh, space. Yeah. Guilty. And, yeah, exactly. You're just exhausted. You just want to like, you know, veg out on the couch because you have no energy. Right. And it, people don't realize it doesn't have to get to that point. You need to always pour water in your own cup first to be able to fill everyone else's cup. 
Mm -hmm. Right. I love that metaphor. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. It just makes sense, yeah, right? It does. Yeah. Completely. So let's talk time management. So for those of us who have just jam-packed schedules, what is your advice when it comes to really filling your day with stress-free time management skills? So I really think it's all about being organized. Uh, people have lists running through their head all day. That in itself, that causes stress. Mm -hmm. That yeah. makes, yeah, that just overwhelms you. You don't, you don't need to memorize everything. Write it down. Have a calendar. Have a to-do list. Put it out, out of your head onto a piece of paper. That in itself, psychologically, relieves a lot and of stress. check everything. Like. Yeah, ch that checking it off is the best feeling, for sure. So what I usually tell my clients is write a list of everything you have to do and then estimate the time. Estimate how, how long each task is going to take you. That way you have a real good, solid understanding of what you have to do and how long it's gonna take. So there's no more stress and worrying and all that. Then I have them prioritize based on when something is due, when you have to do it by, mm -hmm. kind of all of that stuff, put prioritizing most important to least, then plugging it into your calendar, plugging it into your schedule. Every night before bed, go through and see, okay, do I have 30 minutes to accomplish my number one thing on my to-do list? Great, then cross it off. Wow, great, and I get yeah. to make use of all those journals I have lying yeah, around. I know, right? <laughs> Same. I have so many. <laughs> and Nicole, how, how can we best manage all this, the internal stress, kind of what's going on in here and up here versus out in the world? So I, th I think there are two different ways to handle it. One is the actual task, the stress of the actual task, and then the, str the emotional stress within you. Mm -hmm. The actual task, kind of like what we said, is write it out. We, we worry ourselves so much, and yes, people have a lot to do. Put it out onto a piece of paper and recognize realistically, step out of the stress, mm -hmm. and logically realize, okay, this is what I have to do to do it. Stressing about it, worrying about it, it's going to make you backtrack. It's not going to actually move you forward. So all you have to do is logically understand it. Like Nike, just do it. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. So then the second step is about yourself, kind of going into how to manage it in yourself, Step out of it. Go for a walk. Go into nature. Go exercise. Do something of self-care to realize this stress isn't serving me. You're not going to do a good job if you're stressed. You're, the, the work you're going to produce is not going to not going to go anywhere. Right. It's not going to have the energy that you, you need for it. So go take care of yourself. Yeah. Take a bath. Sleep early that night so the next day you have the energy to really accomplish what you need. Yeah. That's. I definitely struggle with you know being present. That's yeah. kind of what you're yeah. talking exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah. It, and that takes, a, you need to step out of it Discipline. for a second. Mm. Yeah, it's a pause, getting out of the kind of the situation on an emotional level and really realizing where you are, where you stand with it, and how to move forward. And you talk about tasks and putting them on a piece of paper. To end, you know, we have um, New Year's approaching. What's the importance of setting goals for next year? So I love New Year's, and it's for some reason everyone uses that as a reason to set goals, which is great because everyone should. But I actually believe that you need to have goals always. Throughout the whole year, there always has to be something to reach for, something to move forward with. Because goals and setting something to look to grow towards, it's movement. And in life, you, you need movement. You can't stay stagnant. It doesn't work. It's not healthy. Because then you feel stuck. You feel like you're in the same place. You feel like you're in a funk. So it's really important to be able to set those goals. Yeah, a lot of people have um, daily goals, weekly goals, monthly yes, goals, right? Yes, exactly. So, for New Year's or for any goals in particular, I think it's so important to have that. But what happens is people set goals that, and if they don't accomplish it within a month, they let it go. Yeah. yeah. They're so hard on them themselves. And, and it is about the big goal, but to be able to accomplish any big goal, it's about setting small goals. Understanding that, let's say if you want to lose 10 pounds, great. But that's everyone's New Year's resolution, yeah, right? Of course. So, yeah, right? So, you know, you're not losing the 10 pounds after a month, and you give up and you go eat 10 pieces of cake. It doesn't work. You need to, okay, this month I want to lose just three pounds. My small goal will be I'm not going to eat past 7 o'clock. That's one little step towards the big goal. And then once you accomplish that, okay, I'm going to stop having wine every single night, you know? So you, you kind of get in the rhythm of really accomplishing what the bigger goal is by setting small goals that you're able to accomplish. It's a process, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, baby steps. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us thank today. We really me. appreciate it. If you'd like to learn more about her and her practices, please follow her on Instagram at Nicole Nora Coaching.
Thank you for joining us today on The Daily Dose. That's all the time we have. Until next time, stay well. The sound of crashing waves in Malibu has turned into ongoing sounds of sirens from fire trucks. The Woolsey fire that broke out last Thursday has several homes in ashes. One landlord on Doom Canyon Road was able to save his home from the flames. I was prepared. I had uh, about 25,000 gallons of water and two pumps and some very brave tenants who ran buckets when we ran out of water. Another resident on Mulholland Highway evacuated on Sunday and was surprised to see his house standing amid so much destruction. I'm coming to terms with what happened in our in this whole entire area is it's a major disaster so you know it's time to uh, start the healing process but I don't think we're there yet. For families that stayed in their homes the American Red Cross is driving up and down the canyons providing vans full of resources. We're giving out rakes, sifters, cleaning kits. Um, these guys need stuff to mostly survive because their houses are still there. So we've, we're bringing them water. They wanted ice, so we're going to try and get some ice for them and check in with them. We got their contact info. People who wish to help residents affected by the wildfires can text 90999 and type in Red Cross to make a $10 donation. For Annenberg Media, I am Marcela Valdivia. Your blood pressure is 112 or 74. Your heart rate is 70 and it's on the normal side. Latino patients trust doctors who speak their language and understand their culture. Now, every time that I'm able to, you know, speak to Latino patients, they just feel a lot more relieved that I'm there, that I can relate, you know, just being able to break the ice and relate to them. Perla Saldivar is currently doing a lot of interpreting work at different county hospitals. According to Kaiser's electronic health records, Latino patients that seek Latino doctors are more likely to take preventative measures like getting flu shots, regular cancer screenings, and controlling diabetes. For patients that have a language barrier with, you know, other providers, it's more difficult to build that relationship. Dr. Consuelo Casillas is a family physician at Kaiser Permanente in Pasadena and serves as a mentor to Latino medical students who are a part of Mi Mentor. So it's the ability to immediately be able to see yourself in that role because you have a role model that you can connect with online or in person. Perla Saldivar's Latino mentor convinced her she could make it. He told me, you know, Perla, it's not really um, uh, if you're going to become a doctor, it's when you're going to become a doctor. So just having that gratitude and just someone believe in me, really. And I was, he was my first like Latino physician that I had met. I'm mid-career, but I, I see that, you know, when I'm gone, I want to be able to have somebody that my patients can go to and I want to be able to um, retire knowing that there's going to be um, others following me. Although Mi Mentor is a resource for aspiring Latino physicians, the reality is that the number of Latino physicians dropped 22 percent over a 30-year period. This is Marcela Valdivia for Annenberg Media. Zero waste consists of reducing the amount of trash sent to landfills. Jonathan Levy is better known as the Zero Waste Guy and since 2012 raises awareness about zero waste on social media platforms. Zero waste starts at home. It's looking at what you already have that you can take with you out in your everyday life to reduce the intake of any disposable items, whether it be utensils, straws, a coffee cup, a water bottle. Jonathan shops at Rainbow Acres, a bulk store that accommodates to customers that bring their own containers. I bring reusable bags, I bring mason jars. I, sometimes I'll even bring existing plastic bags that I already have because if you already have one of those produce bags, it's going to be good to use them over and over again. I don't see it often, but people do bring in their uh, mason jars for our bulk items and then uh, a lot of people do use their reusable bags. Bulk stores like Rainbow Acres continues to create ideas for zero waste. We're working with an uh, organization called uh, Sustainable Works out of Santa Monica and the city of Culver City to uh, increase our recycling. We'll be soon getting a large compost bin out back that we'll dump all our compost in. Jonathan hopes to get more people to become a part of the solution for zero waste. Really it's just important to spend time, don't take everything at face value. 
and realize that we are all empowered to reduce the amount of waste that we generate in our lives. Although the road to a zero waste lifestyle may seem difficult, developing small changes in everyday life can create greater impact in protecting the environment. For Annenberg Media, I am Marcela Valdivia in Culver City. Basil, oranges, chives, and chilies are only some of the produce people can find in the organic edible garden in La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. Los Angeles communities are bombarded with unhealthy food options, but this hidden gem pushes for healthy eating. In a world of consumerism and fast, fast food, a little bit of information like this tends to go a long way, and that's the idea. We want to empower the little ones so that when they grow up, they understand that their history has much more than just grease and lard. The Edible Learning Garden and Culinary Arts Program is a space for students K-12 through to take ownership of the garden and learn more about where their food comes from. In the workshop, students learn about nutritional values of food and drinks. We'll get into fibers and how much quantities of salt and sugar can be found in certain fruits and vegetables. Compare and contrasting healthy drinking versus with soda pop. Students also explore their five senses by learning the process of how food is grown from the dirt and how to create their own gardens. It's not just like look at the plant because you have to experience the smell. So we definitely do a lot of observation, but we do a lot of touching and smelling and tastings. With copal, white sage, rose petals, and lavender, students are able to learn about the series of aromas that lead to better memory. Some people said, I get a lot of headaches, I'm gonna make one with lavender. Oh, my job is really stressful, I'm gonna make one with rose petals because I wanna smell it. So the nice thing is just connecting smells to also well-being. Through smells, plants, and hands-on experience, the program aims to increase the likeliness of students to live a healthy and peaceful lifestyle in the future. It's their foundation, right? And if they learn it now, they're going to have a wider appreciation and know that plants can be there for them if they need therapy, if they need a place to just relax. Although kids are skeptical about the garden at first, at the end of the day, they leave with a stronger connection towards plants. For your hair, it's starting to get a little red again. So then we're gonna put purple. I started pretty much for my bedroom and my dad built me like a little vanity and from there I moved out, got my own little studio apartment and I bought my first actual chair and then I bought the little supplies that I needed and from there I started building clients. They would come to my apartment, I would wash their hair in the sink. My name is Lisbeth Vargas and I own LV Blow and Style located in Echo Park. I came Sunday morning, but like did someone come in after me? As soon as I got the DACA, the doors opened up. I was able to feel confident and go and ask for a job at my dream salon and that definitely opened the door to meeting other stylists and creating beautiful magic hair. I was so afraid of getting turned down because no social, no paperwork, like I never set foot there. So once I got a call from my lawyer and said, you've passed, you have your paperwork, your permit to work, and that just opened up the doors. The customer service that a lot of the girls provide for clients, they make them feel comfortable. Um, they provide an amazing service and not just that, but we want to build a relationship with our clients. We want them to become our, our friends. We're not just hairdressers, we're therapists. I love your hair, it looks great. I'm going to let it fade because I'm going to change it. And I don't want to think it, so I have to let it fade because I'm going to do it. Just swim along. Swim along. Swim along. Swim along. Swim along. I think that anyone else like shouldn't put a hold on their life because they don't have that paper. That's not an excuse to just give up on your dreams because at the end of the day, we as dreamers put so much effort into doing better and making our parents proud because of stuff that they didn't have. So I think that they just shouldn't give up. Jessica Rizendis is the designer behind Raggedy Tiff, a fashion brand inspired by her daughter and popular for its folk cultural style. Raggedy Tiff is dedicated to just basically every single woman that wants to be different. Rizendis discovered her love for fashion when she was 8 years old, but little did she know she would have to jump over hurdles first, like crossing the border at 7 months old. My mom and I crossed the border desert walking and if it weren't for the people she was with, feels like we would have not been where we're at now. You come to this country
country hoping that you're gonna come by really easy, but it's really not easy. And the difficult road continued for the Sandys with very limited resources to pursue fashion. My mother and father didn't talk about fashion or, or anything like that. So it was more me discovering what fashion was. It was more of like self-taught and self-learning things. Since Raggedy Tip was created in 2010, Resendiz has over 50 collections that were created at this desk. Just when Resendiz thought she was ready to pursue her dream at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, she found out she was pregnant and was forced to make tough decisions. It's either you quit college and, and just stay working and be a mom, or you're going to have to figure it out and really uh, stretch your schedule and, and find ways to, to survive. The collections that Resendiz releases every season are a taste of her culture and traditions. I found out Selena through my mom. I inherit that. And uh, more eterno, it's, it's more of like the traditions that my grandma taught me when I was a little girl. We celebrated with Pan de Muerto and, and doing the Santitos and the Altares and all of the stuff in Mexico. With eight years of precise details in sewing, designing, and embellishment, Resendiz's work is definitely nothing near raggedy. For Annenberg Media, I am Marcela Valdivia in Sherman Oaks.